Okay. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. In partnership with Friends of Latin America and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. On Monday, June 7th, on her first foreign visit as vice president, Kamala Harris met with Guatemalan President Alejandro Giamate and made the following comment in a post-meeting press conference. I want to emphasize that the goal of our work is to help Guatemalans find hope at home. At the same time, I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border, do not come, do not come, she said. On June 8th, Harris visited with Mexico's president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, in which she sought to bolster cooperation on border security, Central American migration, and COVID-19 vaccine sharing. Harris said she had very direct and candid conversations about her aim to tackle the underlying causes of migration from the Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Yesterday, a week after Harris's visit, U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, Administrator Samantha Power traveled to San Pedro Sula, Honduras to assess USAID humanitarian assistance activities and programs that promote economic growth, security, and good governance in the country. To talk with us about the Biden administration's economic and political vision for Central America, we are joined by Marco Castillo, who is co-executive director for Global Exchange. Global Exchange is a San Francisco-based international human rights organization dedicated to promoting social, economic, and environmental justice since 1988. Welcome, Marco. I'm so happy you accepted the invitation to join us. I am so happy to be here. Thank you very much, Terry. So let's talk about this past week's week plus events with the Biden administration. Um, our vice president, the vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, was in Guatemala and Mexico specifically, followed by Samantha Power's visit to Honduras yesterday. They came to the region. I say came to the region. I want to say came here. I'm sitting in Mexico City talking with you, just so our audience knows. <laughs> and, um, it was a really jarring thing to hear. I have to say, regardless of politics, it was pretty jarring to hear the vice president's comments, do not come, do not come, when the Statue of Liberty is sitting, you know, off the shores of your city in New York. <laughs> so, Correct. Pretty, uh, uh, pretty callous thing for all of us to hear. So let's talk about what the, these visits mean as far as the Biden administration's vision for the region, Central America specifically, the Northern Triangle, but pretty much the the region of the the hemisphere of the Americas. Yes, um, let me just say uh, that we must not forget that the Biden-Harris administration comes into office after four devastating years when we have seen unprecedented violence on immigrant communities. And the reason why Biden was elected, uh, an important reason for that, for sure, was the separation of families. Many, uh, many, many, many uh, US voters saw the images of families being torn apart and being separated. And that was a big, big, big driver for, a, for you know, for organizing and, and, and pushing for, for a change. And so when, when the Biden-Harris administration, when, when Joe Biden takes office, everybody was, was hoping and thinking that we were moving into a, you know, a, a better place and, and, and a bunch of promises were made. And, and, so and, and and on immigration, one of the first things that he did was like quote unquote like and like ending family separation, but with you know with you know after a few weeks we we started to see that that was still remain uh, not entirely and not entirely truth, and and now uh, we can say without a doubt that the the Biden administration saw 
in 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 their desk sitting you know what what the trump administration had accomplished in for years which is criminalizing migration putting a wall putting two walls in the southern border with mexico and then in the border between mexico and the us you know a, a perfect system of criminalization of separation and and it's obvious that the analysis at the white house was that might as well keeping in place this system and that's when they start to keep silence on on the many many different policies that the trump administration had established and 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 now they decided to change you know the public discourse by saying that now that we're going to change by focusing on the root causes of migration well uh, that's another problematic history that's another that's another you know history where where uh, as um, as you probably know the U.S. has a long history of, of military intervention in Honduras, uh, complicit uh, with, with, you know, corrupted governments throughout uh, Central America. Uh, I mean, today so we have still a president. In 2009, the 2009 coup in Honduras. Yes, well, exactly. Yeah. Today we still have Juan Orlando Hernandez in office in Honduras, while his brother here in the U.S. has been sentenced for for links with drug trafficking and with criminal organizations, and uh, and not to mention the amount of guns that the U.S. exports to Mexico and Central America. The U.S. is not very good at keeping track of how many guns is letting go to the, to Central America, but just Mexico traces approximately 500 U.S. guns per day which is approximately 200,000 guns a year. 70% of all guns uh, uh, in Mexico, of all 70% of all firearms seized by law enforcement in Mexico and 42 in Guatemala were first sourced in the US. So you, if, if, we, if, if Kamala Harris and if the Biden administration in general wants to speak about the root causes, we necessarily have to talk about the role of the US. Are they going back to the previous role? Are they changing the role? So that's why when Kamala Harris show, showed up in Guatemala and Mexico, we had all these questions. Are they going back to the old model? Are they changing? Are we seeing a future? and a possibility of a stronger uh, collaboration of civil society, indigenous communities, and, and what this uh, funding or what all this cooperation was going to go. And again, same. After a few hours, a press conference saying, we, uh, we are collaborating with the federal governments of, of these countries, and, and uh, we ask you not to come. And we, you will be stopped. You will be deported, and um, and so that's that's you know uh, a huge uh, disappointment. That's not what the U.S. Uh, population voted for. That is not what Latin America was expecting from a democratic uh, uh, neighbor in the region. And, and it's sad to see that far from moving away from the Trump administration, they are again re-signing the agreement with Mexico and, and seeking to continue the, the history of, of military collaboration uh, and, and capacity building, arm ex exports uh, of, of the past. So more of the same, more of the same. Unfortunately, you know, there's a couple things um, that I wonder if we could expand on and just for the audience regarding US intervention in Guatemala that started with a, with a, a coup in 1954, um, the overthrow of the democratically um, elected president Otto Benz after a brutal dictatorship. Um, most of our viewers probably remember uh, the Sandinista Revolution and its success in 1979 in, um, in overthrowing the U.S.-backed Samosa regime in their country and on and on and on. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and not just in Central America, but throughout the Americas. So there's a history here that it seems 
is the, the Biden administration is completely tone deaf about. And also when, um, and this might help our audience a bit to understand what's happening today. When Biden was vice president, he introduced, and correct me if I'm wrong, a plan uh, called, I think it was something like the plan for, the, for new American prosperity for Central America. It was an economic plan. It was pretty much a neoliberal privatization plan, which seems to be exactly what Kamala Harris was in right. the region of, to discuss last week, only with new words and new faces. Correct. That's that's what it is. And uh, I mean, whenever we see the details of, of the cooperation that was agreed between presidents of all the documents that we've seen in general, it's the same old formula of military collaboration, uh, giving money to certain organizations pre-qualified by the U.S. embassies to provide some kind of aid, some kind of assistance. And uh, and nothing, nothing else from that. It was interesting to me that um, Kamala Harris's visit to Mexico was right two days after the elections on six, Sunday, June six in Mexico, which was elections for well, they were legislative elections and statewide elections as well. Uh, the president's party lost Mexico City, but gained uh, a number of governorships um, outside of the capital. And it was very curious, uh, her timing to come to Mexico on the 8th with uh, the elections on the 6th. Do you think there was, that was a coincidence? Or, well, of course, her trip had to have been planned long before the elections, knowing the elections were on the 6th. Yeah, well, we're all wondering the same. What we don't know, <laughs> what we know for sure is that it was it's it's a great victory for the president of Mexico, just in the sense that what whatever the result of the election was, Kamala was going to come the next day to extend her hand to the president. And and so I don't I don't know if that date was decided by Mexico or the US, but definitely was a sign of of uh, of you know uh extending a huge arm uh, to uh, the president of Mexico. I think that the US in general has been very thankful with what the president of Mexico has done for the US in terms of militarizing the southern border and containing the flow of immigrants from, from, uh, from, you know, from Central America to the US. The um, Mexican president has put in place anti-immigration policies that we've never seen uh, before in, in our history. Mexico has been a country of solidarity, so like uh, with, a, with a long tradition of solidarity with, with asylees, with, with exiles, with, with Latin America particularly, but throughout the world. Uh, it's been known, it's been a leader, it's been a champion of welcoming uh, political Asylees, and now, unfortunately, we're we're seeing the one of the darkest moments in Mexican history when it comes to welcoming this president who ran under a, a progressive platform, it, close the borders, and it's deporting uh, more people than than ever. I just I want so in, I just want to share with the audience and. You mentioned that you know Mexico having a history of being open to you know asylum, economic, political uh, asylum seekers. In 1936, they were the only country in the world that accepted refugees from Spain during the Spanish Civil Correct. War. And there's a, a very rich and significant history here in Mexico regarding um, that refugee demographic. So yes, what's happening today is is pretty shocking. How how would you qualify or classify the current Mexican president's um, policy? Why, why is he doing this? Is it climate change related? Is it, is it transnational corporate related? Is it a, a forced labor, forced cheap labor situation? What, what is the philosophy behind him um, agreeing? Uh, the what we've seen it's that the you know the president of mexico it's a very very pragmatic leader 
uh, inspired, modeled, and educated in the in the left policies of 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 the 60s and 70s, where where world leaders were strong, were strong in their borders, very very uh, nationalist, and uh, and so this president definitely uh, doesn't go well with migration. It's something that it's beyond his his uh, understanding of 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 politics and and. And definitely, he has chosen to sacrifice uh, migrants, thousands of families fleeing uh, and, uh, environmental disaster and violence in Central America and sacrifice them uh, at the extent of, of being able to uh, win uh, negotiations with the United States in, in, many, in many ways, whether it's like private investments or whether it's like, uh, you know, special collaborations in, in, in specific projects. So yes, I mean, human uh, mobility, it's a movement that has been increasing in the past two decades in the region, particularly from Central America, as things get worse in Central America. And, and so this president definitely does, does not understand uh, the the reality that these families are are coming from, and uh, he he is he is um, he's living in the past. That's fascinating. I mean, because when I mean, I just know when he was elected, it was such a there was such um, excitement throughout the Americas. Well, at least progressive America, <laughs> that you know, a new voice and a new. Um, energy theme and vision for Mexico. And of course, Mexico is so huge population wise and geographically, it, it had the potential to really um, set a tone uh, for, for ensuing progressive governments. And I hear this, I, you know, the things you're sharing with us, I, I hear here living in Mexico City on Sunday the 6th, we saw the capital uh, lose uh, seats, the Morena party lost seats in the capital, gained seats in the countryside uh, or in the countryside and in, you know, and outside uh, the state of Mexico, which is the capital. So it's really, um, it's fascinating to, and disappointing uh, to see what's happening. The Mexico-Guatemala border is one of the most dangerous borders in the world, most militarized, one of the most militarized borders in the world. And the people that are fleeing Honduras and Salvador uh, get stuck there. Uh, if they're lucky to get through, they have a terrible time migrating through Mexico and, and up to the Mexico-California Cali um, border, US border, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from California, so true, <laughs> California yeah. and Texas, California border. Um, Let's talk about some of the things happening in El Salvador and Honduras that are causing people to flee as far as uh, politics, economics, military, US interventionism, um, and also climate change. Because one of the, you know, one of the things that we, we rarely hear about and, and don't talk about often enough is the expansion of the dry, what is known as the dry quarter in Central America that is affecting aggregable land and pushing people off their farms and also causing uh, water shortages, and not just for farming, but for existing period. Yes, let me, let me just say this. If there was a, like an interest, a real interest from the US to really help Central America, reaching the root causes of migration, the United States, number one, should stop the flow of guns to Mexico, Central America. What we live in Central America right now and in Mexico, it's an unstoppable wave of U.S. guns, and I cannot uh, uh, stress this enough, and we, uh, that it's causing uh, the, the highest amount of homicides in history in Mexico and some of the largest uh, amount of, of, of killings in Central America. So that's one thing. The, the other thing is, is instead of, of on funding and, and strengthening the, the um, 
governments, they should be funding the movements that for long have been demanding respect to their land, to their governments, to their human rights, to their environment. Central America has been, the worst enemy of Central America have been historically their own governments. And the US cannot continue betting on that. And many occasions, in many occasions, we've heard people asking us, asking me, but what else is the US government going to do if they don't invest in governments that the, you know, Central America is gonna collapse? Well, I have my serious doubts about that. I believe that what we have are that our, our governments funded and sustained by the US. If, if that if, if you you know if, if you if you stop funding them what's going to happen is that governments that come from the people will arise and will be sustained by the people so that's another thing what we're seeing in Central America in general are the consequences of failed policies and US intervention the US needs to start working home by ensuring and stopping the uh, flow of guns restricting military aid and stop funding corrupted governments and start collaborating with local groups and organizations and human rights organizations in the construction of the new new democracy that Central America deserves. This is, um, you know, you've just touched on a theme that that is recurring in many episodes of our, our program is this this need of politics, uh, candidates, governments coming from movements, from community-based um, organizing and um, and local local structures, and it's a theme that can that that we touch on almost every episode. And I'm so happy you brought it up because we, you know, we can see what happens. Well, let's take Honduras and then we can talk about Samantha Power's visit there, who she is and why she was in San Pedro Sula yesterday. But there's this history of, of the United States military intelligence services. And then, you know, of course the business community partnering with these horribly repressive governments. And in many cases, they actually are uh, drug cartels as in the case of Honduras. Um, and I would argue this has gone all the way back to, you know, the U.S. involvement in Cambodia and Laos and partnering with the heroin cartels, you know, in that era. So this is not anything new. I mean, it's uh, it's disappointing to see, you know, each administration after another um, allow for that uh, paradigm to exist. But this is this is how Honduras has ended up with such a, a criminal uh, government in Juan Orlando Hernandez. They basically are being governed by, you know, a, a narco trafficking cartel. And the United States has partnered with that government and continues to fund that government on many, many levels, principally military. The largest uh, air base is sitting in Honduras. The largest US air base in Central America sits there. And it's almost like once a country is given or accepts uh, US military presence, they get basically a pass and can pretty much do whatever they want. Yes, correct. In, in Honduras, we witnessed it, how the people elected a government that was then overthrown by uh, fail um, um, election and with the support of the United States. And, and since then, we it's been a downward spiral of increasing violence and prosecution and killing of, of human rights and environmental leaders like Berta Cáceres. And for long, it's been proven, documented. There's, there's like, I believe that there's like, like one of the countries with more evidence of the amount of corruption and still the US, it's not moving one finger to change that reality. What else do you want? If the brother of the president, it's being trial and sentenced in the US for links with organized crime and drug trafficking and, and not, not do anything about a brother who was crucifying the lives of millions of people in Honduras. 
and and how what's the moral authority of our vice president to show up in Guatemala and say do not come at the same time saying we're going to continue supporting Juan Orlando Hernandez we're going to continue sending guns we're going to continue uh, criminalizing the drugs that we are forcing you to uh, produce and 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 so it's it's just putting uh, you know lives families in a really 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 bad place because families are gonna continue to try to come through any means necessary to the U.S. People are fleeing their countries not because they don't like their countries. It's because they many times have no other choice. It's a matter of life and death. International protection, asylum has been part of the American identity. And saying do not come is completely the opposite. It's turning your back. It's a smack in the face of a tradition when the US in, in previous time has extended it, its hands to others in other countries. It's very, um, you know, the vice president is a child of immigrant. And so, I mean, that makes it even more harsh. It's, it's almost unbelievable that she said that. Yes. Um, except it's, but at the same time, it's very, very revealing as well. What do you see the, um, the vision uh, for Central America. What is the what does the U.S. want with Central America? I mean, I can I'll share with you, and then maybe you can. What I what I see, what I've watched over the course of my my lifetime, actually, is the continued U.S. Um, interventionism, as you have outlined, in, on many many levels in many different ways, and the exportation of firearms being you know one of the most heinous military and civilian exportation of firearms. There's well, you know, to me, what I see happening right now is the U.S. border basically goes, you know, from the, the, the southern U.S. border all the way down to the southern border of Honduras, kind of leaps over Nicaragua, starts again, Costa Rica, Panama, and right down into Colombia. I mean, is the vision to basically control all of Central America and ultimately more of the hemisphere? Well, I'm sure that that's, that's the intention. Um, uh, when when Biden is in Europe and says America is back, uh, he means something different when Kamala shows up in Central America and says, do not come, we're back. We're back to control and supervise what you do in this country, in, in this region. So yes, I'm sure that's their intention. Uh, Really, I, I have I have my 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 doubts in the sense that you know Central America and Mexico it's not it's the situation is so dire and it's so difficult and and, and it's such crisis that I don't know if, if Central America can handle more more of this. So that remains to be seen. That probably the plan is it's yes to control it. But as we've seen it with the large numbers of people seeking to reach U.S. soil in the previous years from Honduras, particularly, it's clear that it's just a matter of time that there is uh, an explosion, a social explosion in that country. And, and so uh, if the U.S., is, it's, if the Biden administration is thinking that just by sending military aid uh, and supporting Juan Orlando Hernandez, they're gonna keep things uh, business as usual. They are not, they're not being well informed because the, the, the people are fed with. And, and on the other hand, organizations in the United States like Code Pink, like Global Exchange, or have a clear agenda. And the people in the United States, may I, I, let me just be very clear, the people in the United States voted for a change because among other stuff, what we saw happening with families being separated. Yes, we know that Biden has signed an agreement where he's not separating families anymore, but a Title 42 still remains in place. And this Title 42, it's a provision signed by the Trump administration that uses the pandemic, the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic as an excuse 
to send back and the port in unprecedented amounts to African brothers and sisters and people from Haiti and to continue asking Mexico to retain asylum seekers uh, to the US and keep them in Mexico while they wait for the cases. In the end, we're still seeing the same situation. The amount of risk and violence that we're exposing all those families to while they wait in Mexico, it's, it's us if we continue it under the Trump administration. This is unadmissible. This is unacceptable. This is, this is uh, a failed promise, if not, if not a, 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 you know, a lie. It's, okay. um, you know, the, the media manipulation around this story of kids in cages and se family separation is, um, is really important to understand, I, I think, because when, with the prior administration, it, those stories and and photographs and you know, all sorts of social media graphics were very very present. You know, it was really really clear this is what you know the Trump administration is doing to these children, doing to these families. With the new administration, we don't see so much of that in the media. I would argue, not certainly not you know, to the extent we did with the prior president. And it's like, like you said, we voted for a change and there's been a change in, in narrative, but not in policy. Absolutely. You were asking me before about like, how, how can a president like the president of Mexico, it's such a disappointment and, and the same in the US. I mean, what I wanna say is that I am completely sure that being president of the United States or being president of Mexico is not an easy task. And, and, and I understand that there's so much interest and, and there's so much power involved in those, in those positions that I wouldn't even, I can't even think what it, what it means, you know, the, the amount of, of compromises and, 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 and that kind of stuff. But yet at the same time, yet at the same time, it is clear that it's a political class who's resisting to accept the change that a majority is demanding. It's a problem of a generation that has proven in power, that has proven to only be able to solve problems through the military, through through this uh, failed international aid programs, and it's not uh, reading with clarity, and it's not it's not trusting that the people below has been, you know, it's clear and, and that we're ready for a new future. We're ready to be new good neighbors. We're ready and, and, and we're organizing at the local level. We have built and resisted in, in local communities uh, from uh, and, uh, all kinds of, of uh, interventions and, and violence. So yes, it's complicated. Uh, but at the same time, it's a matter of trusting and siding with the people. It is so obvious that the good, that the good morals, the good principles in the case of Honduras are in the people who have been resisted and suffered so much. Yeah. Nobody needs to prove that. And it's so obvious and it's documented in evidence that the immoral, the, um, uh, the personification of the moral, it's Juan Orlando Hernandez. It's the obvious. <clears throat> Everyone there knows it, I would argue, regardless yes. of political affiliation. They, and they're all suffering it, except the, 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 the very small percentage at the very top around him. What uh, was the purpose of um, the USAID uh, visit yesterday? And, and I think for our audience, it's really important to understand who is uh, running USAID uh, under the Biden administration or or Samantha Powers from the- Our, from our understanding here is that the USAID is gonna be the arm through which money is gonna be distributed to organizations, not only in Central America and Mexico, but in the US to go down to Central America and Mexico and help increasing capacity of civil society to educate and process asylum uh, requests from the countries of origin and, and creating this idea of, of we're gonna build an infrastructure that would allow 
uh, uh, families to apply from Honduras without having to move and, and creating this illusion that they're listening and that their requests are being processed when in reality, we know that the crisis and the situation in many of those countries not even let you to stay alive in Tegucigalpa, even if you're from La Sierra, you need to flee the country with anything you have in your hands in, in hours, in a matter of hours. People need to flee. It's not that people are looking for a process. It's not that people don't know the process. And, and uh, people, people don't have other options. So yes, USAID, it's going to create this illusion of, of creating an infrastructure that would help folks to apply for asylum, but the, most of them are going to get rejected, as we know. And, uh, and on the other hand, they are setting the grounds for more military aid at the same time that this is happening. USAID has always played that double, double agent role. It's just a vicious cycle. I oh, yeah, it's just a, a really just a, and it is, and I agree with you. It's, it's an old school. It's a it's a post World War II paradigm that the U.S. is still really caught up in, and, and as far as economics, foreign policy, uh, you know, it's, it's it's exporting this business model by military force. It's it's, it's a very old paradigm that doesn't really have a place in, in the way the world is, has evolved and um, with competing interests around the globe or uh, that's kind of taking us, I wouldn't know, maybe not kind of, but is taking the world, whether the US likes it or not in a more multilateral direction. And the US just seems, and you can really see it playing out here in Central America, this, this old school unilateral paradigm that, it's almost like if the U.S. would almost rather, and on some days I think the U.S. would almost rather see the world just collapse or blow it up, than than evolve into the to the new global paradigm. Yes, it's very, it's very scary. Correct. Some days. Yeah. So, Marco, in our in our remaining minutes, what what can we do as activists and and as movement leaders and as you know, as parents living in communities, what can we do to um, influence the U.S. government, and what can we do to help people in Central America? Well, um, I, I would say we, we need to speak up. We need to demand from our political leaders, both in the U.S. and in Mexico, uh, we elected uh, governments and, and and presidents that run under our uh, uh, progressive platform and we need to keep them accountable because what we're seeing with the uh, you know with the US plan it's not progressive at all it's conservative it's old it's criminalizing it, it, it's a threat to the life and safety of many communities. So we need to speak up. We need to educate ourselves, learn the reasons why families are fleeing. People, people won't be able to follow uh, Mrs. Harris' advice of, of don't come. Why people are going to continue that? Why would someone uh, leave their home and expose themselves to a dangerous journey as Kamala Harris always tries to describe it as a deathly journey. Well, why would people do that if, if, if I mean, it's, it's obvious that it's something that it's not only circumstances, it's a crisis that is caused by the system under which, uh, you know, uh, many of these governments have been ruled under it. And it's not, it's, it's, it's been called democracy, but we all know it's not. The people have elected different, different leaders and they've been overthrown by the US in the past. We know that that's not a democracy. And, and so uh, we, we, we need to continue speaking up. I, I believe there's hope. I believe that there's good in the Biden administration and in the AMLO administration. I believe that it is possible. I, and 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 I just I just think that they they need to be pressured. They need to be they need to be pressured because we saw we saw a horrific Trump administration. And if Biden does not live up to his promises, what can come to the U.S. is is it's worse for everyone. For us in the U.S. and for people in Central. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And I'm, I'm so thankful for your time and for your comments and conversation. I want our audience to know that um, Marco works with Global Exchange and you at Global Exchange do fa fabulous educational webinars on all of these subjects that we've touched on this evening. And so uh, for our audience, please go to globalexchange.org and check out their, their various webinar series. They're, they're very, very good in-depth educational and, um, and with excellent speakers. And you also, Marco, you, you mentioned good neighbor. And I have to say thank you for that because at Code Pink, um, our Latin America team um, is based, our work is all based on our, uh, on the good neighbor policy that we have drafted in hopes of using this policy to influence the Biden administration from an activist position. And um, you can find that at codepink.org slash good neighbor policy. And is there anything else before I let you go? Is there anything else that we should touch on? No, thank you. Just that. thanking you for the work that Code Pink does, for the, the work that all the team is doing. And yes, of course, there are policies that are proposals written and, and proposals that are, that, are, that are listening and touching, like that come from what is happening in reality in Central America, in South America, in Mexico, human-centered policies that are possible, that just need uh, the political will to move forward and become a reality. And this is not just about demanding a change, but also, you know, writing and drafting and Code Pink has done it. They have a proposal written. And so just, just <clears throat> demanding for political leaders to continue, and, and I'm sorry, to listen to it. Yeah, so, well, thank you, Marco. What a pleasure to talk with you this evening. Thank you. I'm so thankful for your time and you're so knowledgeable. I really want you to come back and talk with us some more mm -hmm. as this administration uh, continues over the year, <laughs> the next few years. Thank you very much, Sidney. Thank you. I want to remind our audience that uh, What the F is Going On in Latin America broadcasts every Wednesday. 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube. And also don't forget to catch Code Pink Radio Thursday mornings, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific on WBAI New York and WPFW Washington, D.C. That's a simulcast program on Thursday mornings. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Marco. And I look forward to you joining us again. <laughs>